looked at Simon, uh, Peter last week, to Second Peter, and uh, in chapter one we saw that Peter was emphasizing more than anything else that there is one God, one Father, one Spirit, one purpose, one priority, one everything. And if your life, your life's equation, if you will, because, you know, we're on many level, many faceted person. But if this is you, you know, your, your church or your car and your job and your wife and your children, if this doesn't have a big old G in there somewhere, your life equation, when it comes down to the, the final thing, your life equation is going to be, it's going to equal, I'm going to say this, a little life here on this earth, and then that's going to be it. That's if there is no God involved. In. But if there is, then you're going to have life, and that life eternal. Not just, not just eternal someday but it's going to be big and huge now things now are going to be uh, a lot more beneficial a lot more even in hard times things can be uh, used to the glory of God and this is chapter one well chapter two then anybody any of you guys around here ever farmed or grew, grown vegetables or anything yes. have you yes I do I, I got pots all over my house I am a pot farmer and now I've got Carol doing it. She's got plants everywhere. She's driving me crazy. She just sticks them anywhere. In no order, no rhyme, no reason. Stuff growing up. Oh, stop it. She's got stuff everywhere. Growing Florida cranberries. Who knew? Florida cranberries. Puts this little plant about that big in there. It's a dang tree. In my backyard. What am I going to do with this? So, anyway, that's another story. But... If you've ever grown anything and you go to you go to Lowe's, you go to the store, whatever, and get, get those little trays with like broccoli and cauliflower and all that stuff in them. Y'all do that ever? Mm -hmm. And you make a little garden and you put them in the garden. What's the first thing you the first thing you worry about? Bugs. Bugs. That's that's right. Bugs. Got this beautiful squash plant coming up and all of a sudden all the leaves are all tore up and everything and caterpillars on it. You know, moths and everything walking around on it, aphids, worms, grub worms. Anything and everything wants, not just comes occasionally, but wants to devour it and destroy it. Well, that's pretty much the way life is sometimes. When you women have babies, first thing you do when you get home is what? Child proof the house, right? You go all over the place and take every potential disaster, or at least you try to get every potential disaster uh, safely covered or locked away or put away or something. Why? Well, because that child, as it grows, is going to get into everything. There's no stopping. It's just the way things are. And it's not that he has to or is made to. He wants to. There's always something. Now, you've got to be sharp, stay sharp as a mom, as a new dad. You know, cover up those electric things. Why? Because kids love to stick stuff in them. Why? Well, I don't know. They're just stupid kids. But <laughs> that's what happens. And, you know, I, I did the same thing, I'm sure, when I was that age. And mom was going, get away from that. Well, the same thing is true of the Christian life. The minute you say you love Jesus or that you want to get involved with God, you want to go to church, there'll be 10 people right behind you saying, what do you want to waste your time doing that for? Who wants to do that? I'd rather go to a football game on Sunday. I'd rather go to this one on Sunday. Sea World and Disney World and all this other stuff. Let's go to the beach and hang out. Why do you want to go to church and sit there and a bunch of old cranky people sing stupid songs? And worse, listen to that minister. He's got stupid stories. And... You'll, for every one person that you will find that believes in Christianity, that will support and uphold you, you'll have ten that won't. And it's not that they have to or they're driven to, it's that they want to. And that's just the evil of the world. And sometimes those evil people come as your own family members.
sometimes those evil people come as your brother-in-law or your cousin or your uncle. Sometimes those people that would destroy you come as teachers or professors in college or fraternity buddies. Sometimes they even come as girlfriends or boyfriends. And you need to be aware of this, that, you know, uh, if the minute you hang Jesus on the wall and put God in your life equation, you're immediately going to have controversy and you'll probably have some antagonists show up. Sometimes those antagonists are even preachers and false teachers. And Peter knows this. You know why he knows it? Because he was the bumbling fool who took a long time to figure out that God is God and the number one priority should be Him. It took him a long time to figure this out. But he finally did. Now, I remember in the Gospels, he said, oh, I'll follow you even unto death. Remember Peter saying that? And what did Jesus say? You have to remember what he said afterward? No, you won't. You don't love me any more than anybody else on this planet does right now. The fact of the matter is, I'm probably the last concern on your list. And Peter said, oh, Lord, not me. I'll follow you to death. And Jesus had this painfully but realistically teach him, not only will you not follow me, you'll run away, you'll be found totally faithless, and on top of all that, you will swear with an oath and a curse three times that you don't even know me. And all that will happen before the sun rises. That's a pretty, pretty tough characterization of someone, don't you feel? You are gonna not just fail, you are gonna fail completely. You know why? Because the world is broken and you are broken and you haven't learned yet what needs to be in your life equation to give you life in the first place. And even if you do learn it, see that's the thing about God and Christianity and all that, it's more than just the knowledge and awareness of scripture. I know a lot of ministers that can quote chapter and verse. In fact, I used to work under one 100 years ago. Quote chapter and verse in every book in the Bible, but the fact of the matter is, they're horrible people. They're just not nice people. And you look at that and you say, you know, every time you screw somebody like that or burn somebody or take advantage of somebody and they get a little giggle out of <laughs> And I see that, what am I thinking? Your God is not your priority. Yourself, that's your priority. Or you wouldn't do these things. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I have to drink my... Carol makes me a smoothie every morning. And God knows what she puts in it. But it's supposed to make me feel better. It's got seeds and stuff in it. You know, like raspberry seeds and strawberry seeds. Yes, we're on a ship. Put it on the outside. Then it'll hit the ground. It'll sound like the volcano blew. But um, until he learned that, Peter had to learn that. And he did, I think, at the tomb when they ran to the tomb. Remember, he and John ran to the tomb? It was Peter that went inside. John stopped at the door. Now, I don't know if that was out of reverence or thought, thinking that this is sacred ground. I can't just go barging in there. But Peter went barging on in because he had to know for sure. Later on, when Jesus appeared to the boys and he started talking to them, uh, he asked Peter, what, three times? You remember that? Do you love me? And three times, Peter nonchalantly said, if I can modern par paraphrase it in modern language, do you love me? He said, eh, whatever. He didn't say that, but he said, Lord, you should know I love you. That's not Peter answering. That's forcing Jesus to make that decision. So he asked again the same question. And again, he says, Lord, 
You should know that I love you. <coughs> Again, Peter didn't take it to himself. He didn't own it. By the way, this love here is agape. That's God's unconditional love that no man or created individual is able to do unless they are in God. Peter answered, phileo, phileo. Phileo is, sure, I love you. You know, like I love my brother. I love my sister. Jesus doesn't want you to be his best friend. Never did. He wants to be the bridegroom. You're the bride. He wants intimacy. He wants lifelong commitment. He wants full vulnerability. Surrendered totally each unto the other. Just like a young bride and bridegroom would do. So Jesus asked a second time, do you agape? This is the intimacy. Peter answered a second time. Phileo, you know I love you. You should know I love you. We're buds. I don't want to be your bud, Peter. But being as accepting as God is, he asks a third time, do you love me? But this time Jesus uses phileo. And Peter answers again. Now you don't know this unless you know Greek. But Jesus stooped down to his level and said, all right, we'll be buds for now. We'll be buds for now, if that's the best you can do. And it was on the third time he didn't say, well, Lord, you know I love you. He said, yes, Lord, I love you. He took ownership of that, but it was still in the weakened form of love. He had not yet made that jump to here. Well, it would take years and a lot of beatings and a lot of sufferings and a lot of missionary disasters before Peter would ever ask himself, what am I doing wrong? And then he figured it out. I've not set a true priority. God is not my, oh, I like doing the God stuff and all that. But you know, it's not just showing up on Sunday morning and doing God stuff. It's not just reading and becoming aware of this Bible. It should manifest itself in a total life change. Better, let me say it better. A total life focus. To where literally, literally, as Scripture says, everything can be used for the glory of God. Regardless of the circumstance, regardless of the hardship, regardless of the sacrifice involved. Even if you lose everything for crying out loud. That's the book of Job. The guy lost everything whole family, sons, daughters. The only thing God let him keep was that wife nagging on him. Why don't you just curse God and die? Get out of here, you. But Job held fast, even so strong that the Lord said to Satan, consider my prophet, my servant Job. You'll not find a stronger Christian man in the whole planet. And Satan threw everything he had against him. And he did not move. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. And literally everything was used for God's glory. And it just, he was never defeated. Well, Peter in his life development wasn't so good at that. I'm not sure. We don't know anything about Job, how he became such a strong believer in the Lord, but he did. Something in his life made that happen. Peter still just wanted to be a friend. Jesus doesn't want friends. He wants intimacy. He wants lifelong, full commitment. Anything, everything goes. And most Christians don't realize that today. I would put this into one, maybe three percentile of all the Christians. I would put 99 to maybe 97% in the phileo group. 
Oh, they love Jesus. They'll bless your heart. They'll say, well, God bless you. And they'll say all the right words, sing all the right hymns. But the fact of the matter is, once church is over, they just go home and life is normal. They yell at their wives. They yell at their kids. They yell at their boss. They hate their boss. They, you know, whatever that song is. Tell them I just sailed away. <laughs> my, lo my boss just pushed me over the limit or something like that. I'd like to call him something, but I better just call it a day. <laughs> Go home. That's where most Christians are, especially when their Christianity gets tested. And that's how you can tell. People ask me all the time, how do I know whether I'm walking in the, in the way of the Lord? Well, right here. How would you answer this question? You answer that question genuinely and honestly, and you'll never have to ask that question again. Am I walking in the Lord? Okay, well, Peter knows that once you do this, like Job and Jesus and everybody else, the enemy will come. If you build it, he will come. You put God in your life, you'll be the first one to know how many people around you, even close people, don't appreciate that. Want to kill a party? Go in and say, hey, y'all know Jesus? <laughs> Get out of here. You're the first one thrown out the door. But know that because the world, and Jesus says that in the gospel. He said, the world hates me. It's going to hate you. Because it's a dark, broken place. All looking for their own desires, their own wants, their own needs, very selfishly. And they're not going to care about you. Especially if you bring the light. The darkness can't stand the light. All right. Well, the second chapter deals with this issue. He, he planted this beautiful little garden. All these cute little plants and those nice little rows. And what happens? Well, here comes the bugs. And they're looking at one thing and one thing only. They want to eat that squash plant. They want to eat that. You know, when I was in Kentucky, I've gardened everywhere in my life, all stages of my life. From a child, I worked with my uncles, to every house I've ever owned, any apartment I've ever owned. I was growing something somewhere. And when we were in Kentucky, we were so dirt poor. God, we didn't have a dime. But you could rent for $5 a, a month. You could rent, uh, I think it was 50 feet by 50 feet lot in this giant field that the seminary, it was their property, but it was good Kentucky muck, you know, you grow anything in it. Five dollars a month, you got a 50 by 50 spot and you could grow a few things. Well, I planted uh, lettuce and I planted cauliflower and broccoli and they came up in that muck, wow, big old flower, you know. And I came out one morning to, to look at them and they all gone, eaten right down to the nubs. Well, you know, I was going, what the heck? And I was so disappointed. Carol was in. Anyway, uh, there's an old farmer around there, and he came over and said, Look like you got hit by the bunnies. Well, yeah, they got a million little jackrabbits out there. You know, wild rabbits running everywhere. Devastated the whole thing. I was so proud. I was getting ready to harvest it. Big old things of cauliflower and broccoli. And Mr. Bunny came along and ate them all down, every plant. He didn't just eat one or two and go home and say, well, that was pretty good. He ate everything. And uh, <coughs> the next day he said, what you got to do is go ask your wife if she's got any old nasty pantyhose she doesn't wear anymore. I said, pantyhose? She said, yeah, pantyhose. And, and, and don't wash them. You know, leave that human smell on them. And then when you plant your new little plants, put a big old pantyhose over it. And it doesn't have to be tight or nothing. Just lay it over there and let the plant grow into it, and it will. And when it gets up, your broccoli will be in the pantyhose and your cauliflower will be in the pantyhose. But I guarantee you, the rabbits won't touch it. So that's what I did. Look ridiculous. All these pantyhoses in there. You know, a one-legger or two-legger. <laughs> it's kind of sticking out there. And we grew that whole, that next season, every one of them got to be huge and delicious and wonderful and we didn't lose a one. Because some old farmer said, oh yeah, I've been fighting these bunnies forever. 
The only way I've learned to beat them is this way. Well, that's what chapter 2 is for Peter. He's saying, the minute you plant it, the enemy will make itself known. You got to be ready. You got to be smart. You got to be cunning. And you got to be just as determined to keep your priority as the enemy is to destroy it. Be smart. This is chapter 2. Let's look at it for a minute. Oh, why I have you here, let me announce, because I know all of you will go, well, you never told us. I'm telling you right now, Barbara, are you listening? Lee, are you listening? You're the worst. Racha, I don't know how to say it in Racha language, but I'll have somebody translate it for you. No Sunday school next week. Why? It, we're eating. It's cook-off Sunday. And I want to be a part of that. I always want to be a part of that. So... I can't do it if I'm in here for an hour, then in the church for an hour. Whatever I made that earlier that morning turns to nothing. But if I can cook right up to 11 and bring it in here and put it in the oven for 45 minutes, then it will be good. So, no Sunday school next week, all right? Tell that to whoever usually comes. Because I guarantee you, somebody will come and say, well, I didn't know. Of course you didn't. Also, there will be Tuesday morning Bible study this week. There will not be Tuesday morning Bible study the following week or the following week after that. The reason is I have eye surgery on that following Tuesday morning. It's going to be a three-hour kind of involved deal. They are putting in a cataract, but that's not all they're doing. They're fixing some optical nerves and that stuff so I can get eyesight back in this right eye. That will all take place next Tuesday and last about three hours or four hours, something like that. So no Bible study. It will be this week, but not the week after and not the week after that because they said it'd be about seven or eight days of recovery. I'm going to look like a pirate. So that following Sunday, there will be no, not next Sunday, that's cook-off, but the following Sunday, no Sunday school there either. And, I, and the reason is I'm going to be in still recovery. I will do what I can to get in and preach. Kurt, Kurt's going to be standing by if I need him. But I might have to preach with an eye patch and a pirate hat. And say, Arr, we're going to learn about Jesus. You dirty scallywags. He's getting ready to make you all walk the plank into the lake of fire. So listen up. Anyway, that's coming up. Not like I said, not this week, but the next week and the next week. Okay? Just let you know now, so don't call me and say, Oh, but we haven't Sunday school. Chuck. Not that you ever do that. <laughs> All the time. It's still busted up, but I'm on drugs, so I don't care. It's better drugs. I took my last drug this morning though. We'll see in a couple of days. Okay, chapter 2. Let's read chapter 2. I've almost explained the whole thing to you, but this is where he's going. Look at the first three words. <clears throat> but false prophets also will arise among the people, just as there will be also false teachers who come amongst you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, denying the master bringing swift destruction upon themselves and as many as will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. In other words, they're going to start off by blurring the lines and say, this isn't really all that important. There's better things you could be doing. Their greed, in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Judgments from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. In other words, they're hungry bugs. They're coming. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them down into hell and committed them to the pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and he did not spare the ancient world, his own people, but destroyed preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others when he brought a great flood upon the world of the ungodly. 
And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example for those who would live ungodly thereafter, and if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard that righteous men while living amongst them felt his righteous soul tormented day after day with their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to rescue all the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of his great judgment, especially those who indulge in the flesh and its corrupt desires, despising authority, daring self-will that they do not tremble even when they revile against angelic ministry, majesties. Whereas angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like unreasoning animals or hungry bugs, born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, reviling where they have no knowledge, uh, will in the destruction and the centuries and, and the creatures also to be destroyed. Suffering wrong as the wages of doing wrong, they count it a pleasure to revile those in the daytime. They are stains and blemishes revealing their deception as they carouse with you. I'm trying to convince you. Having, ever, having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, accusing children, forsaking the right way. They have gone astray and have followed the ways of Balaam. He was a bad news guy. The son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but he received a rebuke for his transgression from a dumb donkey speaking with the voice of a man restrained to the madness of the prophet. These are the springs without water. These are midst driven by the storms from whom the black darkness has been reserved. For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they continue to entice by fleshly desires sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error, promising them great freedoms while they themselves are slaves to the corruption. For by what man is overcome, by this he is not, uh, he is not conquered, but is enslaved. For if they have escaped the defilement of this world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they become again entangled in them and are soon overcome. The last state of the man becomes worse for them than the first state. For it would be better for them not to have known the ways of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment delivered to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit. And so, after washing returns, wallowing in the mire. Pretty poignant stuff there. In other words, your little garden there has bugs all over the place, ready to destroy. And you know what? I'm going to tell you right now that the bugs are a lot better doing what they're doing than you are at gardening and farming, even if you're a farmer. Farmers fear bugs, they fear disease, they fear all that stuff, blight and drought and you know, all that. Anything and everything seems to be able to destroy the crop. And so it is in this world. Uh, and it would be worse, Peter says it would be worse if you did set this as a priority and somehow through all their leadings and temptations, you let it fall. And in that case, it would have been better had you never known God in the first place than to know Him, to know of Him and know about Him and taste that light of heavenly righteousness and then throw it all away. It will be worse for you in the second state than it was in the first without Him. Uh, that's not just in First Peter. You know, Paul writes a similar thing. Let me find it real quick in Hebrews 6. <clears throat> Um, listen to these words. 
Hebrews 6, chapter, or chapter 6, verse 4 to 6. For in the case of those who have been enlightened, set God as a priority in their life. For in the case of those who have been enlightened, have tasted of the heavenly gift, have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit poured upon them, and have had the good word of God, and all the powers of the age have come, and then they have fallen away to the world. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance, since it is they themselves who crucify the Son of God and put Him to open shame. It becomes impossible. In other words, Paul and the Hebrews are saying the same thing Peter is. And they're both saying the same thing Jesus taught them. If you put your house in order and leave it unguarded, they will come back, the demons, and it, they'll bring buddies with them. And the second state will be much worse than the first state ever was. And be aware of it. it it's not a, it might happen. It's a, they're going to do their best to make it happen. The enemy is real good at what he does. Been doing it a long time. And you got to be on guard about that. Nobody will bother you. No bugs will bother you until what? Until you plant this little garden. The minute you make that decision, put those plants in the ground, invest your time, yourself, sacrifice everything you are, here they come. You didn't ask them, you didn't invite them, and they don't care. But they'll come. And they'll come in very many ways. Very disguised. Jesus likened them as to wolves in sheep's clothing. Oh, look, a nice little lamb, you know, and then all of a sudden <laughs> your hand's gone because it's not a lamb, it's a wolf. So Peter is saying the second thing um, is just this. If you set God as a priority, the second thing is you need to become your own C-I-N-G policing individual. You got to police your own um, spiritual walk. Again, if I ask the question, do or if you ask me the question, uh, am I walking in the way of the Lord? I'm going to give you this to answer. Where are you right here, Peter? Jesus is asking you, and He'll ask you three times. Do you love me? Am I still a priority, or am I just a good friend, a buddy? that you can take or leave whenever you want. You know, I was in a fraternity at the University of Florida, and there was never a closer group of guys than the group of guys during the four years I was there. We, they, I don't know what it was, everything just clicked. We got in, everybody had nicknames, it was a crazy time, it was the 70s for crying out loud. And we just sort of grew together, more than just buds, uh, more than just fraternity brothers, you know, that take one for the team. But we won a bunch of championships and sports. God, we were tearing them up. Just, and all oh, sororities loved to be at the Beta House. It was great. But when I graduated, I had to leave all those guys. And if I go back to seminary, or not seminary, college, University of Florida again, for a homecoming game or something now, 45 years later, I might see one or two of those guys and I'll say, hey, hey how's it going? There's a guy named Crab. We call him that because he can do the perfect imitation of a crab. I'll say, Crab, what's up? He goes, hey, Jenner. And we talk and we're good and we're nice friends, but that intimacy really is not there anymore. You know what I'm saying? Good friends, love the guy, always did. But now it's just, hey, how you doing? What happened? What happened to that exciting four years to be a beta? Well, I'll tell you what happened. 45 years passed. That's what happened. I got up. I got growing. I got successful. I got used to the rest of the life. I got a job. I went to seminary. I became a minister. I've been in a dillion different churches. That, you know one of the reasons why this church existed or exists today? Because 36 years ago, we got together and said, I'm tired of all this nonsense. Can't we just build a church where you teach the Word of God and that's it? 
No denominational stuff, no magazine stuff, no videos or movies, no projection. Let's just learn what the Word of God says. So we did. Now, we didn't want to be a rogue church, so we aligned ourselves with the Evangelical Covenant Church, but they believe like we do. God must be a priority. Not in cliche or, oh yeah, but in real action, real life, <coughs> where real people are good people. I don't know if y'all know this for this little church family or nothing with all its warts and bumps and bruises and, you know, we give each other crap constantly. It's a family. It's more than just a bunch of people, random people showing up on Sunday morning. Everybody loves everybody out here. That's the beauty of this thing. When I retired, that's what I missed the most. It wasn't the knowledge, wisdom, or presence of God. I got all that. It's no accident that Jesus said there's two commands you need to follow. Love God. Take care of that. And number three, we're going to get down here. Love each other in the same way you love God. Racha. That is a pet name. I don't know if you like that or not. I never bothered to ask you. I just like to say it. I just like to say it. Racha. But I only do that to people I love. You know, if I didn't know somebody over here, I wouldn't go to all that. And you guys have been here forever. You two, I saw born here. Grow up here. Sadly, you're bigger than me. Of course, everybody's grown bigger than me. <laughs> I think this generation's over the six foot line or something like that. You see what I'm saying? It's a family. And we need to learn to love ourselves first, take care of that love, maintain that love in others for 45 years. Who is the greatest example of that in the Bible? Well, Job was, but that was a single lifetime. The greatest example of that was John, the Gospel of John, uh, the revelation of John, the very end of it. What happened? Well. He was a young man, 30, 35 years old, strong. I love God. He had his head against the breast of Jesus, you know, at the Last Supper. And he was real strong in Jesus. He watched and learned and soaked in, drank in everything from Jesus when they were together. In fact, if Jesus had asked him this question, he'd have answered right. That's why I think John was present at the same time and Jesus and he went walking off. And Peter said, well, wait a minute. How come I don't get privileged like that? Then came these three questions. So that makes me think John was there. He figured it out somehow. John was the only one that went to the crucifixion. You remember that? All the other guys ran away and hid. John stood there with the three ladies. He risked his life. He risked everything. But he was going to be there with his Savior regardless of what happened. He didn't care about the world, the soldiers, the Romans, anything around. He just wanted to. So I think that shows that, yeah, he would have answered this question correctly. 45 years go by. He's no longer a young man in the fraternity, so to speak. Now he's an old man. He's a broken down man. He's been beaten up a whole lot of times with this Christian thing. And the Romans grab hold of him, and instead of just killing him, he's the last one, the last apostle, still alive. All the others are dead. He's lost his family. He's lost everything he knew, his home, his property, everything. And they take him out to the island of Patmos, which is nothing but a rock in the middle of the Mediterranean. And they left him there, knowing that, you know, he would die in a few days from lack of water. There's no water there. Lack of food. And if that didn't do it, the elements alone, the sea, and that would kill him. Just a convenient way the Romans had of getting rid of people they didn't like. Didn't want to turn him into a martyr, so he would just die un unknown to anybody out there on the island. Well, they left him there, they sail away. He comes down to the beach one morning, old broke, he falls in the sand, falls on his face in the sand, and he asks God one question. Oh, wait, not that. Yeah. 
is this, whoops, true? He asked God one question. Is it true? Is it all true, this stuff that Jesus talked about? Because at that point, he sure couldn't see any reality of God's blessing, that's for sure. Broken, suffering, sore, old, wasn't the mighty young upstart he once was, but an old broken man. And the greatest miracle in all the Bible happens at that moment. You know what happens? God shows up. God shows up. That God he said as a priority so many years before. Now he's so broken, so wasted, so torn up. His humanness caught up with him. And after years, a lifetime of faithfulness, he says, do you, it was John saying, do you still love me? Almost these questions in reverse. And God answered with a gut bang. God shows up, pulls him up out of the sand, kind of wipes him off, says, come with me, John. Let me show you. Off he goes, and of course he sees the entire kingdom of God every day. And the Lord returns him to the people. We don't know how. But the Lord returns him and he says, write these words down. These words are faithful and they are true. And take them to my children in the churches. Well, John would do that. He would write the revelation and he would live a a number of years more and then he would die just like everybody else does we don't know how we just have no record of it but somehow he got that word back to the people so that they could make this decision themselves and set God as a priority just like Jesus said my father's kingdom is incredible if it weren't so I wouldn't have told you John got to this part in his life where he says come on really I've set you as a priority. I've kept you as a priority. I've always lived. And look at me now. He's about to die on a lonely island. And the greatest miracle that God, he said, is a priority shows up. Wow. It says, come here, John. Have I got something I want you to see? And in the midst of showing him the kingdom, what does he say? Write these words, they are trustworthy and they are true. That's the same thing as Jesus saying, if it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. Take them to my children in the churches. And of course he returned to earth, got off the island somehow, I don't know, God put him somewhere. And boom, we have the revelation. The same thing, the, the fulfillment of what Jesus promised at the Last Supper. Well done, good and faithful John. Without John, we would have half our gospel would be missing. So, chapter 2. Be weary. The enemy will come. They came against John, and whether the Romans admit it or not, they did finally break him to where he doubted. But he was smart enough, instead of running away, to run to the Lord and say, do you love me? Is all that stuff Jesus said true? And God showed up and said, let me show you, boy. Chapter 2. As soon as you put Jesus in your life, the world will say, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, and the bugs are coming. Get them off. Okay? That's it. Next week, uh, well, there's no Sunday school next week, but we'll finish it up in a couple weeks. And uh, get in the cookoff. Yeah. I want some cucaracha.